Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 322nd episode, we have a ton of new dinosaurs. I think it's the most ever for an episode of I Know Dino. We're covering four small theropods. I'm mm-hmm. calling it the small theropod spectacular. <laughs> Following up from our Ornithischians episode, and before that was all about sauropodomorphs. Yes, and we're going to have an episode that's all about sauropods next week. Oh, good. Maybe one more theropod. But this episode isn't entirely about theropods. You also have Dinosaur of the Day, Hippo Draco, which I believe is an herbivore. Yes, it was an ornithopod, but we'll get into that later. And before we get into that, real quick... I want to thank some of our patrons for keeping the podcast running. And this week, I'd like to thank Quinn Pomeroy, Trev, Remy Rodriguez, Rhino Source, Taya, Stefan, Blue Gollimer, the Tolbert family, Leah, and Tarkia Tamer. Hey, thank you so much for being part of our community. We say this every week, but we really do mean it that your support is what keeps this podcast going. If you want to join our growing community and chat with all the dinosaur enthusiasts on our Discord, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. So jumping into our small theropod spectacular. You get the feeling you like saying that. (laughs) I'm pretty happy with it. It's probably going to end up being the title of this episode. Mm. We'll see. I'm going to start with my favorite of the four articles. It was free online, which is always good for bonus points, but it was also just fantastically written. There were really good graphics to go with it, so I really appreciated it. And it was written by Hussam Zahir, hopefully I got that right, and others, and published in Contre Rendu Pelevol, I think is roughly how you say it. Pretty sure it's French. I hadn't heard of this journal before, but I think most of it is open access and free online. Nice. So that's excellent. I always like to find more journals that are like that. The new dinosaur is named Spectrovenator. I'm going with Venator because I feel like that's the way most people say it, but it could be Spectrovenator too. Mm -hmm. It's an abelosaurid from South America. Again, abelosaurids are the group that are sometimes sort of thought as the southern tyrannosaurs. Generally, they were large predators with tiny arms, even smaller arms than T-Rex, The most famous is Carnotaurus. Hmm. Definitely one of the funniest dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But also freaky with its, like, horns on its head and everything. It's got to make up for its tiny arms. Yeah, I guess so. It does. (laughs) Mouthful of sharp teeth, too. But this new dinosaur is much smaller than Carnotaurus and just smaller than you'd expect for an abelosaurid in general. Its full name is Spectrovenator Rajai, and Spectrovenator translates as Ghost Hunter... Oh, but it's not in a ghost hunter sort of discovery channel ghost hunter like people looking for ghosts. They say that that name, quote, refers to the fact that the specimen was found unexpectedly underneath the holotype of Tapuyasaurus. Hmm. Yeah, pretty weird. I'm still not entirely clear on how that makes it a ghost hunter. Right. Tapuyasaurus made it a ghost. I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, is that what happened? Like it's haunting it after it got killed? Or is it like it couldn't have been hunting it because it was a ghost? It was already dead by oh, the time Tapuyasaurus was yeah. around? Or is it because Tapuyasaurus fell on it and crushed it and then it became a ghost? Mm. I don't know. They didn't really talk much about it in the article. It was pretty short. It's a nice name. Yeah. I thought it's really cool, and it's also a really good find. I was surprised there isn't very much of a write-up on this anywhere. Like, sometimes you see it written up in Scientific American or National Geographic or something. There's very little on Spectrovenator, which is why we have this podcast. (laughs) But (laughs) that also means that I couldn't figure out why it's called Ghost Hunter exactly. Maybe I need to reach out to the authors and see if I can get an answer, a little more clarity on what makes it Ghost Hunter-y. But like I said, it was found under the holotype of Tapuyasaurus, and that's a sauropod that was described in 2011 in a pretty big quarry. It was about 25 square meters roughly by looking at their site outline, which makes it over 250 square feet. It's a pretty big area to excavate, so I guess it's not too surprising that they found another dinosaur Mm -hmm. when you're excavating that large of an area. But it is weird that it was completely beneath it. Right. But real quick, what's the species name mean? Oh, yeah. I totally skipped that. It's Rajai, and that's after Dr. Jean-Claude Raj. 
and he is a significant paleontologist. So it makes sense. Mm -hmm. He worked in the area where it was found. The holotype of Spectro Venator and the only individual of Spectro Venator that's ever been found because there's just the one that was squished under the theropod. Maybe squished is the wrong term because they didn't talk specifically about if they died at the same time. So maybe it's hundreds of thousands or even millions of years older, depending on how much deeper it is and how fast that sediment was laid down. Mm -hmm. We don't really know exactly how much earlier or it could have been at the exact same time for, for all I know, at least. The holotype includes the full head and several neck vertebrae, a complete set of legs, hips, and quite a few vertebrae stretching into the back and tail from the sacrum. Hmm. So it's a pretty awesome find. The back vertebrae are also preserved with ribs, and there's also a set of 10 vertebrae from near the tip of the tail. There's sort of a gap in the tail that we're missing. Then we have some more vertebrae, and then we're missing the very tip of the tail. It's pretty complete. Yeah, it's really good. It's preserved in an articulated fashion, too. So it's it's always nice when that's the case so you can see exactly how things lined up and be confident that they all came from the same individual rather than potentially being from different animals or even different species. They managed to excavate it all in a single block. Wow. It gives you a clue, though, that it's not nearly as big as that sauropod originally that was excavated. And it might also be easier to just explain what's missing from the dinosaur. It's basically just missing the chest, arms, and the base of the neck, and then a couple little segments of the tail. So the complete skull is really the greatest part of this find, I would so say. We don't know how short its arms were then. No, yeah. So it's an early Cretaceous find, and most of the abelosaurids, these really big ones like Carnotaurus and stuff, are from the late Cretaceous. So it's always good to see that sort of transition and when did they get these characteristic weird features that make abelosaurs abelosaurs. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, yeah, we're missing the arms. So it's sort of like alvarezsaurs where now we have filled in the gaps a little bit and we've seen the arms before they shrank completely. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this doesn't let us know in the early Cretaceous if they had tiny arms yet or if they still had more normal theropod arms. They didn't give a size estimate at all in the paper. And again, there weren't really any write-ups I could find, at least in English. So I went through the supplemental material, and they had lots of great images that were drawn to scale. And of course, they had all the measurements for important bones. And for reference, the skull is small enough that I could view it at life size on just a typical computer monitor. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not Carnotaurus scale at all. The whole skull is about 22 centimeters or eight and a half inches long. The jaw is a little bit longer at about 10 inches or 26 centimeters long. So that's that's a pretty small head talking about abelosaurs. From a really rough estimate, scaling some of those bones to the skeletal drawings that they created, it's very roughly about two meters or seven feet long and about one meter or three feet tall. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's small. It is small. That makes it only about a third of the length of a Belosaurus, and from my approximations, roughly Dromaeosaurus sized. So still not a dinosaur you'd necessarily want to run into, but small for theropods. Yeah. Well, small for abelosaurids. Yes, very small for abelosaurids, I would say. It was small enough that I checked the measurements three times because... I couldn't believe that it was that small. It was like two meters long is really small for a, a theropod dinosaur. And it doesn't have a really thin gracile head. It looks like it's built to chew on something a little bit. So <laughs> I was I was very surprised by the small size. Do they know if it was an adult? I don't think they know. I looked through the article for any references of lags or histology or juvenile traits or fused vertebrae, mm -hmm. which are things we often talk about with adults. And they didn't mention any of that. They focused more on what made it a unique dinosaur. Mm. So that's a good point. Maybe this is not an adult and that's why it's so small. I'm not sure. Yeah. The pictures of it, though, are really awesome. I think they're beautiful. It looks like it was pretty shattered before being put back together. There's a lot of glue holding these different bones together. And most striking to me is the head that's full of teeth. It hmm. looks a lot like just a museum quality mount where 
it's a copy of something with a lot of gaps filled in, but it's the real whole fossil. The only thing it's really missing is the tip of the premaxilla on the top. So like sort of the front teeth and a little bit of bone near it. But based on the bones around it, they could still tell how many teeth were in that premaxilla because wow. they got enough of that. And then there's a little bit missing on like one side of the head, but then we have the mirror image on the other side of the head. So you mm-hmm. can easily fill in the other gaps that are missing in the skull. It's a really good find. The skull in general combines some basal and some more derived features, as is often the case. I mean, that's sort of the definition of an individual species. But in this case, it's even more of a combination of the two than you might see in other dinosaurs, because one of the characteristics of abelosaurs is that they have this extra hinge in their jaw called the kinetic intramandibular joint. Hmm which gives a little bit of extra flexibility, and it's presumed that abelosaurids had some specific use for that. Like maybe they open their mouth really wide. Sometimes they talk about them like hatchet eating mm-hmm. on larger animals like titanosaurs. Right. Also to offset the arms, probably. Yeah. So like there's some specialized use potentially of this intramandibular joint in abelosaurs, but it's fused in Spectro Venator, so it did not have that special ability. Its head is also a little bit boxier (laughs) than other abelosaurs, for lack of a better term. Carnotaurus is really weird because it almost has like a circle head. (laughs) You know, it's like it's got that really like parrot sort of curve to the front of its head, Mm -hmm. if you know what I'm talking about. It's really short. It's like sort of, I don't know, like a silver dollar fish or something. (laughs) It's a very round kind of weird head. And a lot of abelosaurs kind of have that shorter front to back, but taller bottom to top Mm -hmm. head. This one is at first glance more like a platyosaurus or to me kind of a combination between an albertosaurus and a Utah raptor, Hmm. it's just like this boxier head Mm -hmm. than what you see. It doesn't come to a point as much at the tip of the snout. But it's still a relatively robust skull, although with a much thinner jaw than you typically see in a carnivore, which is the same as you see in other albellosaurs. They just have a really thin lower jaw. It doesn't look like they could really put a lot of pressure on their prey, Mm -hmm. sort of like with Platyosaurus too. They have that thin jaw. If you had to pick a dinosaur that it looks the most like, I would say Abelosaurus, the original Abelosaur, Hmm. is the one that it looks the most like. That makes it easier to categorize. It does, yeah. (laughs) But Abelosaurus is pretty late in the Cretaceous, and it's not really that close phylogenetically for what you would expect this one to be related to. It's kind of interesting that they look quite a bit alike. But Abelosaurus even has a little more of a taper to its nose and its snout than this one does. Spectro Venator is from the early Cretaceous of Brazil. I don't, I'm not sure if I mentioned Brazil earlier. It's estimated in the Baramian to Aptian, which puts it between about 125 to 115 million years ago. And abelosaurids were all the rage back then in Gondwana. <laughs> all the rage. <laughs> That's all anybody talked about. <laughs> <laughs> no one was really talking back then. <laughs> They, I mean, they could have been vocalizing about them if abelosaurs True. were coming. True. <laughs> but even though abelosaurs were presumably very common in that time and place, it wasn't until the late Cretaceous that the well-known species like Carnotaurus and Majungasaurus arrived on the scene. Phylogenetically, Spectrovenator is a true abelosaurid, according to their analysis at least, not in the broader group Abelosauroidea. But it is in an outgroup all by itself. So it's one of these where it depends how you classify things. Like I said, it has some features of its skull that are like an abelosaurid and some that are like more basal non-abelosaurid taxa. And that's not too surprising since it's at least 15 million years away from its closest relatives. So there's quite a bit of distance there. It would be weird if it was the same genus or if it was really similar (laughs) to another dinosaur with all that time in between. Although it happens. The researchers point out that it's the first early Cretaceous abelosaurid that's been found with a good skull, Hmm. making that skull all the more important. Mm -hmm. But again, unfortunately, we don't have the arms, which is another really unique feature of abelosaurids. Doesn't mean they won't be found later. Very true. And it also shows that the more unique skulls of derived abelosaurids may not have arisen until the late Cretaceous, 
possibly linked to a new feeding strategy. We know a lot of things changed around 100 million years ago when they transitioned from the early to late Cretaceous. And Spectrovenator appears to be a little bit more of a generalist in its feeding style than later abelosaurids. Very cool paper. And anyone can read it because it's freely available online. Yay! As all papers should be, because most of them are funded with public money. But Aren't more a... papers moving to open access? Yes, I think so. Slowly but surely. Up next, we have another abelosaurid. So it's not just theropods, it's abelosaurids. Yes, well, I mean, we have two abelosaurids and we have two non-abelosaurid oh, okay. theropods. <laughs> but I figured might as well do the abelosaurids together. This one was written by Mauro Aranciaga Rolando and others and published in the Journal of South American Earth Sciences, which is not open access. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> the dinosaur that they named is called Niebla. And Niebla is Spanish for mist because it was apparently foggy when they excavated the fossils. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, there seem to be a number of dinosaurs named for the environments in which they were found. Like Irritator? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty good sounding name, Niebla. Mm -hmm. It's also easy to look up the pronunciation of because it's just a Spanish word. So I like that about it. And then the full name is Niebla Antiqua. And Antiqua comes from the Latin for old, like antique. And that is because it's old. They said it's a reference to the age of the specimen, which seems like a waste because what fossil isn't old? So they mean in terms of because the fossil was old or because this individual was old? I'll, that Yeah, that could be because they thought it was an adult. So do you name something old because it's an adult? Could be. If that's your only specimen for the species. It makes a little less sense if you find multiple specimens <laughs> that are a variety of ages. Because they presumably at one point were born and hatched and were not old and would still have this species name. Mm. So, yeah, that's a good point. I think you're probably right, though. That makes more sense than what I was thinking. I assumed they meant old like it's from a long time ago, but it's only from about 70 million years ago, which is like half the age of the previous abelosaurid even that we were talking about just a minute ago. But maybe it was old for an individual abelosaurid. Yes, you're probably right. Especially because the paper talks about how the species is relatively young for an abelosaurid. It is an old, young abelosaurid. Exactly. And it was found in the Allen Formation, which is in Rio Negro in Argentina, also known as Patagonia in this case because it's southern Argentina. That area, the Allen Formation, is known for lots of other dinosaurs. There are a couple of large sauropods known from the area, including Pan American Saurus and a couple theropods as well, including Austroraptor. Hmm. The competition. Yes. And potential food. Yes, all of the above. Fortunately for us, they did do histology. They sliced into a rib to look at the lines of arrested growth or lags and count basically the number of those and they're analogous to tree rings. They found about nine of them, or they said at least nine, mm. meaning that it's at least nine years old. And they determined that the outer lags are close enough together to count as an EFS or external fundamental system. But that basically just means the lags are starting to pile up closely together. Mm -hmm. And that means that it's probably about done growing. So this Niebla skeleton is probably about done growing. And yeah, maybe that's why it's antiquous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although there are some T-Rex individuals that we know are over 30 years old. Yeah, it varies so much in dinosaurs. I mean, modern dinosaurs, some of them take like three months and they're pretty much fully grown. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, T-Rex, it took as long as we do or longer to get to full size. They describe Niebla as small to medium-sized it's smaller than other coexisting abelosaurs like Carnotaurus and Abelosaurus. It's estimated to be only about four to four and a half meters or 13 to 15 feet long. Oh, but it's still bigger than Spectrovenator. Yes, it's not hard to beat. <laughs> it's also smaller than at least one of the theropods that's in the same formation with it because Ostroraptor is estimated to be about 20 feet long, although Ostroraptor being a raptor is pretty skinny. So they were probably in different ecological niches. So 
maybe Niebla was eating something else. Didn't have to compete so much. The holotype is not fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> they found a relatively complete shoulder blade. That's sort of the crux of the description, as well as a few ribs, incomplete vertebrae, small fragments of the jaw, teeth, and then one of the best things is a nearly complete brain case. Mm, those are fun. Yeah, you can learn a little bit about what their senses were like and potentially what they're related to. Mm -hmm. But overall, it was pretty incomplete, unfortunately, and none of it was articulated. Not that it would matter that much if your rib is lined up with your shoulder blade. It's not going to give you a whole ton of information. But the shoulder blade is pretty similar to Carnotaurus. It has a lot of similar features to it. And as a reminder, despite the tiny arms on Carnotaurus, it has really large shoulder blades. It's really weird. <laughs> the way If you ever look at a skeleton of Carnotaurus, pay attention to its scapula coracoid, that bone that sort of runs over the ribs and then more or less meets in the front of the rib cage where like our sternum would be. It's... It's so weird. Real muscly dinosaur. Yeah, but like what what muscles were attaching to these shoulder blades? I sometimes think of it like almost like Gastralia, like it was there to sort of support the ribs and the, mm. the bulk of the animal more than actually attach to other things. Maybe it provides a buffer for when it belly flops. Yeah, I was I was wondering that too. I don't know. It's weird. The authors pointed out that it lacks a clear attachment point for the biceps muscle, which is the same as relatives like Carnotaurus. So, yeah, it's just, it's weird. And the arms were clearly weak. It didn't need these huge solar blades to support the arms. It must have had some other purpose. But the best purpose we have for them today is that it helps us differentiate Niebla from some of the other abelosaurs. So, how's that going for it? And it's one more theropod to add to the Allen formation in Patagonia. It's always good when we get a better idea about all the animals that are in an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Now we've got a pair of Chinese dinosaurs to talk about. The first one is a new Tyrannosaur. Oh. Yeah, everyone likes a good Tyrannosaur. This one was actually published back in April of 2020. But Oops. <laughs> it's still within a year. <laughs> is that, is that <laughs> recent enough? I don't know. It's still new. It's probably not in any dinosaur books yet, at least. The paper was written by Xiao Chun Wu and others and published in Cretaceous Research. And as you'd expect, it is from the Cretaceous, specifically the late Cretaceous. But that's about all you can say about it. It's somewhere between 166 million years ago, based on that time frame. One source listed it as between 99 to 71 million years ago. So maybe other work has been done in the area and they ruled out the Maastrichtian and then other than that, could be any part of the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. It's still like a 30 million year time range. Someone needs to find like a sea creature or something, a radiometric date in that area so we can figure out when this formation is from. And the formation in question, I should say, is in the Shanxi province in China. We don't talk about that area all that much. It's southwest of Beijing. We're usually talking about like northeast of Beijing or southeast of Beijing or sometimes just southern China. This one's more towards the middle, but close-ish to Beijing. Apparently, that area only had herbivores and just some theropod teeth until this dinosaur was found. Ooh, so they knew there was a theropod in the area. Yeah, but officially, it's the first non-avian theropod named from Shanxi. And although a ton of dinosaurs were collected, I think, in the 90s in Shanxi and have been named over the last couple decades, this one was actually collected more recently in 2008. Its full name is Jinbeisaurus Wangai, and Jinbeisaurus comes from Jin, which is the abbreviation for Shanxi province in Chinese, and Bei, which means north in Chinese, so it basically translates to the north Shanxi province dinosaur. Not the most exciting name ever, but it sounds okay. Jinbeisaurus. Mm -hmm. Rolls off the tongue. It does. And then Wangai is after Mr. Suoju Wang, a vertebrate paleontologist from Shanxi who found a lot of reptiles there, among other things. Nice. Yeah, I always like it when the species name is after a person rather than a place. Or just <laughs> the fact that it's old. <laughs> originally Jinbeisaurus 
was considered to be a juvenile Tarbosaurus, which, of course, made me wonder, well, is it just a juvenile Tarbosaurus? Are they just naming something that used to be called a juvenile Tarbosaurus because they felt like naming it, because people like naming dinosaurs? But then I saw that Thomas Carr is on this paper, and he is very much not a fan of Nanotyrannus Mm -hmm. and knows a lot about Tyrannosaurs, which is, I'm sure, why he's on the paper. So I assume he looked really closely at that possibility and ruled out the potential for it being a juvenile Tarbosaurus. Mm -hmm. Because how embarrassing would it be if you were railing against Nanotyrannus and then named the Nanotyrannus equivalent for T-Rex's closest cousin, (laughs) Tarbosaurus, (laughs) in Asia? (laughs) They didn't find a ton of bones, but it was enough to have a decent shot at naming it and defining it as its own Tyrannosaur genus. In total, they found a pair of maxillae. The right one is nearly complete, while the left one is quite a bit less complete. An incomplete right dentary, also known as a jaw. An incomplete pubis, one of the hip bones. Some of the vertebral centra, so just the center part of the vertebrae, none of the big zygopophyses or things that stick off of the vertebrae that sometimes are more helpful in naming a dinosaur. But unfortunately, all of it is disarticulated again, so we don't have a ton of information from the find itself. It's considered small to medium-sized. The incomplete maxilla is about 35 centimeters or over a foot long, which after looking at these other two dinosaurs, it's like, that is not very small. Mm -hmm. But for a tyrannosaur, it's relatively small because that gives an estimated skull length of about 66 centimeters or just a little bit over two feet, whereas a T-Rex skull is like four to five feet. So yeah, it's small for a tyrannosaur. Still has those sharp teeth though. Oh yeah. They describe the size of the skull as similar to the tyrannosaur Shongguanlong, and Xiong Guanlong has been very roughly approximated at about 4 meters or 15 feet long. So that gives a rough idea about how big this dinosaur is. So technically, it's sort of the similar length to Niebla, but I'm sure that being a Tyrannosaur, Jinbesaurus is much bulkier and probably a lot heavier. Although Abelosaurs weren't that skinny, but still this would have been probably bigger. They didn't do histology on any of the bones. I mean, they didn't have any long bones to work with, which are what you like to work with when you're counting lags, something like a rib at the very least, but ideally something like a femur or a tibia or something, humerus maybe. But they do have a pretty good clue that it was probably an adult, even though it's only the centra that are preserved. And as soon as I read that, I was like, well, that's useless. You might as well not even look at them. They came up with a really clever way to use them to learn something new. What they saw was that the neural arches were broken off and they weren't just simply sort of missing. If it was a juvenile, they likely wouldn't have broken off because they wouldn't have been fused yet Mm -hmm. and it would have separated more easily. But since it was broken instead of bent or just missing these pieces, that indicates that it was probably an adult. I thought that was pretty clever. It is. And this means that in the late Cretaceous, somewhere in the 70 to 100 million years ago, time frame, tyrannosauroids were still small in Asia. This supports the previous hypothesis that the first giant tyrannosauroids likely evolved in North America, possibly around 80 million years ago when sea levels temporarily dropped and tyrannosaurs made it across basically the Bering Strait from Asia into North America. Uh, They took advantage of the low sea levels. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then found a niche in North America, bulked up, and then some of them went back to Asia, presumably at their larger size, (laughs) and found niches over there. It would be really helpful, though, if we knew something a little more specific about its age. Like if we knew this was 70, 80, 90 million years old, that would help narrow down that size change a Mm -hmm. little better. And phylogenetically, it's really hard to place, given the incompleteness of the find, They say it's possibly more derived than other similar Asian tyrannosaurs, but I don't know. It's it's like you just have a little bit of maxilla and a centra to go by. Like, they need to find some more fossils, which they also said in the paper, before you can really say too much about it. I think the most important thing is just that element of it looks like Asian tyrannosaurs were still small, even in the late Cretaceous. So that helps show that maybe they bulked up in North America. 
took advantage of the low sea levels, and then bulked up and took over. Yep. <laughs> and then returned. <laughs> took over there as well. At least Tarbosaurus did. And last in our small theropod spectacular, you can't have a small theropod spectacular without compies, <laughs> the most famous of the small theropods, I might say. They are small. Yes. And the paper that described this new compi was written by Lita Shing and others and published in Cretaceous Research. I should, I can't remember how long ago I realized that it wasn't pronounced compsognathid, but compsonathid, but that's really the preferred way to say it. You don't say the silent G in the middle of nathus. It's like, that means jaws. Anyway, mm. pronunciation is hard. It is. That's why I like nicknames like Compies. Yes, that's partly why I like to say that too. <laughs> but Compsonathus, Compsonathids is the best way to say it if you're trying to sound all professional and correct. So this new Compsonathid, hopefully I get that right the whole time, was found in the Hua Jiying Formation in northeastern China. It's from the early Cretaceous, but unlike the previous find, we have radiometric dating from this formation, so we know it's about 130.7 million years old. That's very precise, especially compared to the last one. Exactly. <laughs> Got it narrowed down to like 100,000 years versus 30 million. It is nice. Its full name is Shunmeng Long Yinliangis, and Shunmeng is Chinese for swift, and then Long, of course, is for dragon or really dinosaur in most cases. So you could translate it as swift dragon or swift dinosaur, if you prefer. Does that mean it was fast? Presumably. I mean, compies, they're small. Mm. They're pretty agile, I would say. Probably had to be. <laughs> yes. And then the species name Yinliangus is after the Yinliang group, meaning like a group as in a geological feature. And the holotype is also stored at the Yinliang Stone Natural History Museum, which they say is, quote, currently housed in the Global Stone Museum. Oh. Quote. So there's a museum inside a museum, I guess. It sounds like an epic museum. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't find too much about it because it's, unfortunately, it's all written in English, which in this case means it's really hard to Google search for the Chinese thing. Maybe I could translate it back into Chinese and then do a search and find that museum. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Because if you search in English, the only thing I found was an Australian blog about it from like a decade ago, and it wasn't even fully constructed at that point. Mm. But somewhere in a museum in a museum is Shunmeng Long. <laughs> and it's a pretty decent find. They found a lot of vertebrae, including the sacrum, a partial pelvis, and most of the hind limbs. It's kind of a weird story because a private collector had assembled Shunmeng Long before donating it to the museum, but it was assembled in kind of a weird way. It was combined with at least two other animals to make a more complete-looking find. They sort of stuck different things together. I don't know if the collector stuck them together, if they bought it. I'm guessing they bought it sort of reassembled because that's been done. Even fossils that end up in museum collections sometimes have this weird chimera things glued together and you don't notice until you do a CT scan and notice that the rock is different or something. So to be specific, the tail vertebrae, ilia, meaning the top of the hips, femora, and right lower hind limb were all in one block. So we're pretty confident that is all from the same dinosaur and that could easily be the holotype. Mm -hmm. The left lower hind limb was separated and they did that to make it look like it was running. Hmm. So they sort of cut one of the legs out of the block and then moved it into a position so that it's not just like curled up dead. It's like right. now moving. Showing you it's swift running. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then the left femur is probably the original, but it's unclear because it's been separated out of the block and sort of prepared a little bit. And the piece in the original block doesn't match up perfectly with the part that's separated. So just to be extra cautious they're not including it in the description and saying it's potentially from another dinosaur but they needed to move that in order to make it look like it was running but unfortunately to make way for this realigned femur it looks like they just threw away the pubes or the lower bone of the hips hmm. so those were probably just discarded and nobody knows where it is which is a big bummer mm -hmm. 
it's now been disassembled so it's no longer this weird chimera it's in its normal <laughs> positions they say that the bones are all quote compressed fractured and split at the interface between slab and counter slab end quote and that the counter slab is missing hmm. so it's not exactly ideal in terms of bones that you could do much with like histology for example you're not doing any histology with these smashed and compressed bones it's just gonna be too difficult to work with right as a result it's possible that shun Meng long is just a young or small example of an existing species but that might be unlikely since it's the only compsonathid from the formation although there are other compsonathids known from the general vicinity and time so could be one of those i suppose another case of need more fossils yes very much Unfortunately, no feathers were preserved. No. Although they, yeah, they sometimes are in that area. But the claws do have keratin sheaths. Oh, that's cool. So that might maybe indicate that it, this Compsonathid didn't have feathers. But it's one of those absence of evidence. Is it evidence of absence sometimes? Maybe not. And based on the author's comments, it looks like it's a little bit bigger than Scipionics. Scipionics is about 30 centimeters or one foot long. But Scipionics is known from a juvenile. So maybe this is the smallest ever compsognathid. That also depends on whether or not you consider Scipionix to be a compsognathid or not. That's a little bit controversial. Or a compsognathid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go, messing it up again. Compsognathid. But assuming Shun Meng Long is an adult, it might be the smallest known compsognathid anywhere. But we don't know because we can't do histology. Correct. And we don't really know how big Scipionics got as an adult. And so we got like multiple unknowns going here. You say correct like a game show host. <laughs> We've been watching too many game shows, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> What's my prize? <laughs> you win more facts about Shun Meng Long. Oh, okay. So it is the earliest known Asian Compsonathid. And phylogenetically, it's close to Compsonathus. Oh, as a couple of theropods that are phylogenetically close to the dinosaur who named their group. Very true. And in case you're wondering, Compsonathus is way bigger than Shun Meng Long. So if you're thinking of Compsonathus as like the smallest or like this little tiny dinosaur, this is way smaller. It's more like a pigeon size is one way to think of it. A really tiny dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, when it fits in your hands, that's tiny. Yes. I think another reason they might have called it Shun Meng Long, meaning, you know, swift dragon, is because in addition to its age and size, some of the distinguishing features are the relative lengths of the foot and leg bones. And depending on those ratios, you can assume that it might have been a better sprinter, basically. So maybe this dinosaur was a little bit quicker than some of the other dinosaurs. Plus, it was originally presented in the sprinting position. Yeah, <laughs> it would be funny if that was the reason. <laughs> Someone went through all this trouble to make it look like it was fast. Give them what they want. Mm -hmm. Now, in other news, in Washington State in the U.S., there's a push to make Sushasaurus rex the official state dinosaur. And real quick, it's the first and only dinosaur found in Washington State. They found a left femur in 2012 at Susha Island State Park. It sounds like it might become official soon. Yeah. <laughs> You don't it, sound excited. It, it does sound like it might be. But Sushasaurus rex, I mean, it's probably dubious. It's only known from a single bone. It's also probable that it kind of washed up to Washington. It's not even known from a full bone. I just double checked. It's like maybe a third of a femur, kind of the middle part of a femur. <laughs> just there's barely enough to know that it's a theropod. How are they naming a dinosaur out of this? It's just it's Well, like, they already named the dinosaur. If I lived in Washington, I would want it to be my state dinosaur because it's fun to have a state dinosaur and that's the only one tied to the state. It's. I think it's still only informally named, though. I don't think it's actually been in a paper yet. I'm not sure if this would pass peer review. It was officially described in PLOS One. Yes, I just looked up the paper. It is officially described, but they call it Theropoda in debt. Mm. They didn't actually name it Sushasaurus. They just talk about a theropod from Susha Island. 
And then I think people just like adding Rex to things to make it sound dinosaur-y. Mm. So they call it Sushasaurus Rex. But come on. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> just, Again, if I lived in Washington, I would want a state dinosaur. So I understand. Just be patient. It's it's only been like 100 years since we started paleontology. Something will turn up that's better than Sushasaurus. Well, wasn't Washington mostly underwater? It was, but a California was too. And we've got a couple dinosaurs now. Mm. We got an ankylosaur and an ornithopod. And one of them is our state dinosaur, Augustan Olifus. That's true. Well, anyway, we'll keep an eye out. Don't do it. I kind of wonder <laughs> if it got revived after all the excitement around Massachusetts, maybe Probably. having a state dinosaur. Yeah, but that's an actual dinosaur. They have two dinosaurs to choose from, actually. Washington has zero dinosaurs from choose from. They're just making something up. Uh, I think it's fine. <laughs> I think you're being a little harsh. <laughs> it's going to be like there have been other states that name dinosaurs that end up being dubious later. And then they find a real dinosaur later, but they're stuck with this dubious name. Well, we'll see. In Orlando, Florida, Lou Gardens has a dinosaur invasion exhibit from now until April. They have 20 dinosaurs spread out across their 50-acre garden. And there's dinosaur stations and a map so you can find them. But if you visit, you do have to wear a mask. It's good. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Hippodraco, which was a request by Elrex via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. So Hippodraco was an Iguanodontian ornithopod that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Utah in the U.S. in the yellow cat member of the Cedar Mountain Formation, so it's northeast of Arches National Park. It was an herbivore and it was small and gracile. It was estimated to be about 15 feet or four and a half meters long and weigh between 500 and 1,000 pounds. That's 227 to 454 kilograms. So you're adding a small ornithopod to our small theropod episode. Yes, although this ornithopod is bigger than half of the theropods you talked about. <laughs> That's true. Maybe three quarters. <laughs> Maybe three quarters, yeah. <laughs> Hippodraco may have been bigger if the holotype is a juvenile, so maybe it wasn't that small. So the holotype is possibly a juvenile. It's UMNHVP20208. We are joining the giving out specimen collection numbers party. Sometimes. I don't think I'll have them memorized the way you do. I don't have many memorized. You know more than me. <laughs> anyway, the holotype for a Hippodraco includes a nearly complete skull, dentary teeth, vertebrae, right humerus, right scapula, left ischium, right tibia, right femur, and left metatarsals. And it had a large orbital in the skull. That's why they think it's possibly a juvenile. Hmm. It probably looks like other iguanodonts with a bulky body. And the foot bones, the metatarsals, looked similar to Camptosaurus and Iguanodon. Hippodraco had this unique shelf bone that extended along the lower jaw that's parallel to the tooth row sets. Part of the skull was crushed, and a lot of the bones were crushed, and the brain case was poorly preserved. The dentary teeth were in situ, but they weren't well preserved. They were cracking and fragmented. However, the shelf bone on the lower jaw looked to be a distinctive feature, and not a pathology or deformation. The type and only species is Hippodraco scutodens, and the genus name means horse dragon. <laughs> yeah. It's just like hippopotamus translates, I think, to like water horse. Yeah. And Hippodrago had this elongate head like a horse. The species name means shield tooth and refers to the shield-shaped dentary tooth crowns. Like the scutes on ankylosaurus, same root word there. Mm -hmm. I like the analogy of ornithopods to horses. They always seem a little more horse-like than cow-like to me. <laughs> You think they can run faster? <laughs> yeah, and they, the head, too, I agree. In general, more so than like a duck bill, it's more like a actual horse head, mm -hmm. I would say. Although horses have really weird heads. Right. Because they have that big soft nose, so they sort of end in a point on the skull. It was kind of weird looking. And hadrosaurs, don't we now think a lot of them had beaks? Yes, which is more like a duck than horses that have big fleshy lips. Mm. So Hippodraca was found in 2004 by Andrew Milner, and the site where it was found is known as Andrew's Site. And then it was named in 2010 by a different Andrew, Andrew McDonald and others. <laughs> 
Fragments of other specimens were found at the site, but there's not enough fossils to know if they belong to Hippodraco. Hippodraco is part of the subgroup Styracosterna, and its closest relative is Theophytalia, an iguanodontian. And Hippodraco helped show that early Cretaceous iguanodonts in North America were more primitive than iguanodonts in Europe and Asia that lived at the same time. Hippodraco lived around small lakes with slow-moving rivers in an area with a seasonally dry climate, and other dinosaurs that lived at the same time and place included ornithopods, like Iguana Colossus, sauropods, like Cedarosaurus, theropods, like Martha Raptor, notosaurids, like Gastonia, and Dromaeosaurids, like Utah Raptor. Can't have an early Cretaceous Utah fauna without Utah Raptor. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess you can, because it wasn't around for all the early Cretaceous, but... Right. And it wasn't Utah until recently. (laughs) Very true. And our fun fact of the day is that the Allen Formation in southern Argentina includes both Bonapartosaurus and Bonapartonicus. Hmm. Both of those are named after Jose Bonaparte. This led me down a little bit of a rabbit hole, because I wanted to know... How many things have been named after Jose Bonaparte? A lot of things. <laughs> well, you talk about Jose Bonaparte all the time in your Dinosaur of the Days, mm-hmm. especially when you're talking about sauropods, I feel like. Or dinosaurs from Argentina. Yes. He is widely recognized as the main early proponent of Argentine paleontology. There's all these quotes by famous North American paleontologists calling him like, I think Bob Bakker called him the master of the Mesozoic or something. Oh, that's a good title. <laughs> yeah. He's very well respected. He was born and raised in Argentina. He started collecting fossils without any formal training, which isn't too surprising because if you're the, one of the first people doing it in the fields in that country, where are you going to get formally trained? But eventually he did create his own museum and later received an honorary degree as a professor. He taught many of the current generation of Argentine paleontologists. But unfortunately, he passed away last year at 91 years old. Hmm. Well, they did live a long time. He did, yeah. And made a ton of contributions to science, especially dinosaur science. He authored or co-authored the name of at least 22 dinosaurs. Wow. Including Carnotaurus, Abelosaurus, Alvarezsaurus, Amargosaurus, Argentinosaurus, Saltosaurus, and Musaurus. We talk about all of those a lot. Yes. I picked those out because they're some of the most popular ones, but especially Alvarezsaurus and Carnotaurus, like Argentinosaurus. Oh, man. Those are great. And Saltosaurus, the sauropod that has scutes. How cool is that? Funnily, though, he reportedly preferred to study mammals, Aww. but his Wikipedia page doesn't mention any sort of mammal research. <laughs> so either Wikipedia is really biased. Also, another article or two I read about him didn't mention any of the specific mammals. So either all of those sources are really biased towards dinosaurs, which is possible because they're very popular, or he just was less successful in finding mammals in Argentina than dinosaurs. Like Ernst Stromer. He went to Egypt to find mammals, well, fossils of mammals. He ended up with Spinosaurus. (laughs) Yeah. They're definitely better off, whether or not they'll admit it. (laughs) (laughs) As far as I can tell, though, it's only those two individual dinosaurs from the Allen Formation that have been named after him. He named 22 dinosaurs, but I think only two are named after him. Bonaparte Nikus, which is an Alvarosaurid, obviously, like Mononicus. Or Mononicus, I guess it could be Bonaparte Nicus, which I think is pretty fitting because Bonaparte named Alvarosaurus, so having an Alvarosaurid named after him makes sense. And also Bonapartosaurus, which is a Hadrosaurid, and he found a really famous Hadrosaur in Argentina as well. Cool. I couldn't find any Bonaparte Ensis that were named after him. There are some animals that have Bonaparte Ensis in their names, but I think they're all named after lakes like Lake Bonaparte, or there's an area off the northern coast of Australia that's called Bonaparte, where there's like a mollusk or something from there. Hmm. I couldn't find any dinosaurs that have Bonapartensis. He's definitely a very significant paleontologist, and it's and it's a good thing there are some dinosaurs named after him. Definitely. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our community, patreon.com slash inodino.
Thanks again, and until next time.